So Neil Robertson needs to thunder Neil. down under the mobile right? machine that Mark Selby, the Justice. No, I'm just well, I'm sorry, a, a really I, big favour. I'm trying mate. to do my no, 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 just research. Mid session, mid session interval, right? Can you just give Baywatch a plug? Would you mind just having a chat about it in the studio? Bay, Bay's what? Baywatch. Bay's Baywatch. Is, is what that, is it? You must have seen it. It's a monthly show we do. Just kind of. I've never seen it. No, like, can't you see? I'm busy. Twenty quid. No, no. Listen, go. Just go away. I'm right in the middle of this. Where I've got matches to do. Okay, Max, throw this bloke out, please now, because I'm, I'm right in the middle of something. You know. Who the hell is he? Don't come back. Some people, man. Anyway, here's what's coming up on the show. Coming up, Jack Lizowski wears a hat. Stephen Hendry tries to use a laptop. Yeah, it's not working. Players show off their best impressions of a manatee. <coughs> oh, this should be it. And Emma Parker steps up to take on the Great British Break Off. In a month that's seen us rack up over 10,000 miles on the World Snooker Tour, here's a look back on all the action that's been happening on the table. Stuart Bingham returned to the winner's circle to claim the Bet Victor English Open title. The 2015 world champion securing his first silverware in over a year. Masters champion Mark Allen produced a break-building masterclass as he fired in 14 centuries on his way to claiming the international championship title in Daqing. And a pulsating Mambet X champion of champions final saw the rocket Ronnie O'Sullivan and the warrior Kyron Wilson go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. There were twists and turns, however, it was O'Sullivan who came through in a deciding frame, 10-9. Now, in the modern era, it's hardly uncommon to find sports stars changing up their sports. Usain Bolt going into football, Conor McGregor trying his hand at boxing, and despite his recent success on the table, our very own Jack Lazowski is trying his hand at horse racing. To find out more, we headed over to Cheltenham, which is also home of the upcoming World Grand Prix, to see if he can swap the green bays for the green turf. Gonna find it tough. We're at Cheltenham Racecourse. It's the most demanding track that the country has to offer. Um, but you know he's got a lot of potential. He's got the right build to be a jockey. So there's hope for him yet. Ready? No, I'm definitely not a cut off the sport. I was speaking to Ryan and he's kind of like broken every collarbone. It broke both collarbones three times, he's done his back and showed me some scars on his arm, so I thought I'm kind of going to stop here, so I'm not going to do any more horse stuff from today. What do you make of this venue? There's a chance of, of you playing snook here, of course. It, it, it's, a, it's a cracking venue, isn't it? Yeah, I think, um, I think I've got a good chance of being in that tournament now for the, after the first few tournaments. And uh, it's an amazing, I've never actually been here and this just incredible so and it's such a beautiful day so I'm really looking forward to the tournament in February. What's it going to be like the feeling of being a, a local favourite, a local I'm hero? not sure, I'm ne I've never had it. Um, I think was it in India the other, the other year 
Aditya got to the final, so sometimes it kind of spurs players on. Hopefully that can happen to me. You made a very, very strong start to this season. How, how, how do you think you, your games, how, where, where do you think your games at, at the moment? Um, I think my game's improved a lot in a year and I've just been putting in a lot of work into, and, and there's been so many tournaments, I'm getting kind of calmer at tournaments and starting to kind of play better and better so hopefully I can keep that up and like I said it's been my best, um, last season was, was my last season was my best season and it's been a strong start to this season so. How important was the experience in Riga getting to a final, that was something that was coming, people knew it was coming and, and that must have, have really been beneficial? Yeah, it's my first final, so that's cool to experience it. And I just want to kind of try and get back in that situation again now and um, hopefully win one. And kind of learning how to stay with players, not go for as many reckless shots. And my safety's got a lot stronger, so that's kind of keeping me in games. And you know, like the, so far this season, I feel, feel like I haven't really scored that heavy yet. So hopefully when that kind of clicks, then I can start um, getting to the later stages of tournaments. We know you've got speed, that's something that is a reason why people enjoy watching you play. Is that something which, which aids you? Is that, do you find yourself in a comfort zone when you're playing quickly? I think if you're playing well and you play quick, then it's quite hard for the other player. But um, then when you kind of start missing shots, I have to rein myself in, like that one, and um, <laughs> slow down a bit. So um, it's, it's a plus, neg positives and negatives. People put you in that bracket with Ronnie and Jimmy and the entertainers, is that as important as winning matches to you? How do they, how do they Yeah, work? I definitely don't want to ever play and get into kind of like, I don't like it when the games go flat and it's, and you can kind of feel the crowd go, it, it, snooking can be tough sometimes, you know, you can get like half an hour where it goes a bit flat, so I like to kind of try and play as quick as possible and, and you know, make it enjoyable to watch, but um, by the same time, you, same token, you've got to kind of knuckle down sometimes, and I think that's what I'm trying to do. Like I said, not go for as many reckless shots, and um, maybe it's you know I've been pro for quite a while now, so it's just I think I'm a bit of a slow learner, but I think everyone's got to do it sometimes. What are your ambitions now in in, in the game? I would love to um, win a tournament that's just kind of by the end of the season. I'd love to have a, a good run in the World Championships and. Uh, Hopefully in the next few years, kind of be, be, win the World Championships. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to, that's, I think that's everyone's goal when they set out to play snooker. And now I'm starting to kind of believe and my game's coming together. A year ago, I was kind of possibly going to drop off the tour. And now, I think I read one last week, it was like race to the Masters, the top 16. So it's been a real roller coaster of a year, massive turnaround for me. And um, I just really hope I can keep going forward. And, uh, you know, it's all about hard work and just staying motivated. I've just got to keep on top of it all and hope it all kind of keeps improving. And I'm pretty sure it won't be long before we see Jack joining the winner's circle. Next on Baywatch, if you ask any snooker player what their greatest ever shot was, I think a lot of them would struggle, especially when you've won as many titles as Stephen Hendry. But in his recent autobiography, he does just that and picks out his greatest ever shot. And to find out more, we caught up with him in Coventry to let him talk us through it. Well, this really is a terrific gamble. And that's why he's the number one in the world. Wonderful shot. Best shots I could remember, sort of, certain shots stood out in my career. Um, you know, re remembering matches and tournaments um, was quite difficult. Um, but some specific shots were obviously um, match turning shots. Um, uh, you know, obviously shots like uh, the brown against Jimmy, the blue with the rest against Steve Davis in the same, you know, in the final of the UK. Shots like that I remember quite vividly. And what was it about this particular shot that made it stand out for you? Well, it kind of turned the final um, against Jimmy White. Um, you know, I was I was 14-8 uh, down. Um, you know, I, I won the frame to go 14-9. Then I was, I, I made a, you know, a really good clearance uh, up to the point where I left myself on the red to the yellow pocket. So screwed back, I, but I never had much angle in it, so I couldn't get the cue ball away from the cushion. So I ended up screwed back for the blue, but obviously landed the wrong angle of the blue to get on the yellow, um, which was near the bolt cushion. So to be honest, I didn't even think twice about playing it brown. I mean, looking back on it now, it's just like a, a you know, real crazy shot to take on 14-9 down at the World Championship. If I miss it. Jimmy wins his 15 nice like you know 
three frames away from victory going at the evening session. So um, yeah, it was a pivotal, pivotal shot. The, the final red, as I said, you know, it was pretty straight. Um, so I've got to screw it in, hopefully, and just it's sort of any angle in the blue, so I can just drop the blue in and, and land automatically on the yellow. Um, but yeah, the white's just landed right in the jaws, so the middle pocket. Um, but you know, watching this now, I mean, the, the shot really is to roll up to the black and snooker, Jimmy, on the yellow. Yeah, and I'm strong favourite to win the frame. I didn't even look at it. Um, so yeah, just the brown was the obvious shot. It was automatic position on, on the yellow. I didn't think, even think at the time, how difficult the shot was. It was just the shot to play. Um, I remember watching it back from a book and seeing John Burgos saying it's the bravest shot he's ever seen. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, looking at it now, you know, it, as I say, if I miss it, you know, there's no way probably I'm coming back from 15, nine down uh, in the final session. Um, and that was, you know, these, these matches, long frame matches, the momentum is so important. That gave me momentum going into the evening session. And I kind of knew that, you know, we had an interval before and I kind of knew that Jimmy would be on the back foot. There'd be doubts might be still creeping into his mind. So it was a, yeah, it was one of the most important shots I've got in my career. Interestingly, in your book, you talked about when you first started playing snooker at the age of 12 or 13, all you wanted to do was just put all the balls and, mm. and just keep going until, until there were no balls left on the table and there, there was no compromise there. Is, that, is this shot kind of the ultimate example of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's when you get in the table and, and, and you get a chance to win, you take it. You don't... Um, you know, I've never wanted to, as I say, play the safety shot, delay it, and try and try and you know, um, you know, outfox my opponent with, with with great safety play. My game is all about just get in there and clear the table and win the frame as soon as possible. And it's also noticeable in that shot how still you keep, how how still your head is. Is it one of those shots that you have to get everything right technically in order to execute that shot? Yeah, very much so. I mean, obviously, anyone watching that, if if the if the cue ball's tight to the cushion um, as it was, um, the principles are keep as still as possible. Um, fortunately, there, there was so much on the shot, I didn't really think about technique, that came automatically. Um, and was that particular shot also about showing to Jimmy that there was no backing down, you know, you, you were going to try and steamroller him and that there was, you were trying to build that momentum? Well, I, I didn't deliberately set out to do that, but there's definitely a, a, a part in that where, you know, you put your opponent on the back foot and thinks, wow, if he's going to take these shots on under that kind of pressure, um, you know, it, it really you know, puts them on the back foot kind of thing. Um, as I say, to, to get that shot and, and the momentum was, was, just, uh, was just incredible. Snooker is one old game. And we all know its origins, it was invented in India way back at the end of the 19th century by Andrew Higginson. But did you know before all of that came other variations of the game such as billiards, pool and massive snooker bowls? Hello and welcome to Massive Snooker Bowls. I'm Phil Yates and to be honest, I don't know what I've done to deserve this. I'm clueless when it comes to this amalgamation of two sporting genres. Let me give you the rules. They are quite simple, like me. It's five players, three shots each. Closest to the target claims the spoils. So here goes. <laughs> First up, it's the 2015 world champion, so many you get? Stuart Bingham, recently crowned English Open champion. Down to the shot, physically and metaphorically. Is this a, a judgment call? First shot of the day, he's the guinea pig. And quite frankly, Stuart, that is appalling. You said it is fast. Must do better. I think he'll make the necessary adjustment here though, ball run. He needs to get this ball running an awfully long way. Go on, Paul. They say when you haven't practiced for a week or so, a snooker table seems 100 feet in length. Well, this really is a lengthy playing surface. Now, there's Ivan doing the, the measuring. 127. Ah, 147 then. He's feeling the pressure. Now, what about Stuart? <laughs> Multiple ranking event winner. <laughs> what are you trying to do? Being given encouragement, if that's what you call it, by his fellow man of Essex, Mark King, who, by the way, is up next. Now, Bingham loves this. Running after it, he thinks it's curling. No brushes here, though, just cues, and I'm afraid it doesn't work. 
the first score on the board, and I'm afraid it's not all that convincing. Stuart Bingham, 127 centimetres from the target. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. Here he is, the left-hander, former Northern Ireland Open champion. In shorts, looking very casual. Yeah, that ain't a bad shot. But I can tell you what, he's a fighter, a competitor. He'll want to win this. He wants to win everything. And that's not a bad start at all. How far, Ivan? Now, that is one bemused former world champion. He's only got the tape measure out. He's got the tape measure out. Hey. Sean Murphy, walking past, can't quite believe what he's seeing. What, centimetres, inches? I've got it now. This should be it. This should be the now absolute then. daddy. Come on, Mark. You've had your first go. Will the second one be an improvement? A little bit steamy, a little bit steamy. It's in the trench, I believe. Is that worse? Yeah, no cushions here. Who's fitted this table? The jolly green giant, Mark. That's who's fitted the table. The third and final go right, for the Essex left-hander. Will the Southpaw solve the mystery? I'm afraid not. That's I'm weak. I've had enough. That is awful. His best effort, 240 centimetres from the target. Third up in this five-man contest, it is from Scotland, Eden Sharav. Can he do better than two world ranking event winners? Conventional cue action, if not conventional stance. No stance at all, actually. He's lying down. Now that really is poor. Doesn't even reach the equivalent of the English border, the Scot. Can he make the necessary adjustment? Well, the answer was no. So this is third and final try. Now this looks pretty decent. Better than that, it's the Garden of Eden. Heavenly Nirvana. Would you believe Mr. Sharav has got it to within 34 centimetres? That's the mark we're getting from Ivan Hershevitz down at the target. That will take some beating. Now, in terms of world ranking, we have the favourite here. Neil down, kneeling on his knees. It's an unusual way to approach the shot. Right, so you got to just smash it. And if the first one is any idea, well, I'm afraid he's not got this worked out whatsoever, the Australian. So if that's got the legs, go, keep going. Look at the line, the line is just it perfect. It looks like the Antipodean is going down under. Now I know how hard to definitely hit it. One more shot to redeem himself, the 2010 world champion. Oh, that's way too hard. Hates to lose. Or is it? But I'm afraid after Turn this. Turn to the right. Turn to the right. Surely defeat is going to come his way. Hold on a minute. Oh, that's the pace Needs to apply the brakes. It doesn't. Just about stays on the playing surface, but it's Eden Sharav who remains in front. Oh! And finally, the oldest competitor. Right, so he goes. And you can tell that from the way he got down there with all those involuntary grunts and groans. In his mid-40s, Mark Davis, a recent runner-up in the English Open. Oh, it's perfect. Woo! Oh, and that one has got far too much pace. With a name fine. like Davis playing any form of snooker, you have quite a legacy to uphold. I wonder what Joe and Steve would make of this. Oh, what is that? Words can't describe it, Mark. Awful. Now we'll mark beyond the mark with his final shot. Nowhere near. Well, that's a little more respectable. But what we know, the crown will go north of the border. Eden Sharav, the champion of massive snooker balls. Next up on Bay's Watch, the great British break-off returns. This time with former world under-21 women's champion Emma Parker taking on the challenge. Can she knock Ali Carter off the top spot? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Emma Parker and I'm about to take on the great British break-off.
And that is almost it for the show this month, but let's take a look at what's coming your way over the next few weeks. This week we're in Belfast for the Bet Victor Northern Ireland Open. Last year, Mark Williams claimed his first title in six years to spark a golden season. Who will step up to the plate over the coming days? York then hosts the first of this season's Triple Crown events, the Betway UK Championship. Ronnie O'Sullivan will be looking to defend his title and claim the £170,000 top prize. We then travel north to Glasgow for the third leg of the Home Nation series, the Bet Victor Scottish Open, where Neil Robertson will return as defending champion. And that's all we've got time for this month. Once again, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed it and we will see you again in December. Yeah.